Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first uh, webinar from uh, um, Tyro uh, Multidisciplinary Sem Seminars for 2023. Um, uh, I hope everyone had a wonderful uh, holiday and um, new year, and uh, welcome back. Um, we do have a wonderful session this morning that I'm uh, really looking forward to. Um, and um, it is truly international um, in scope here. We have um, our first presenter um, presenting from uh, Australia where it is midnight and um, our discussant um, is presenting at 4 p.m. from um, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Dr. Bramwine and I are here in New York um, where it's a more respectable um, uh, 8 a.m. here. Um, but before we get started with our program, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to make certain that all of our listeners are aware of the upcoming meeting of the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer scheduled to take place in London um, uh, from June 15th to the 17th. Um, so you will be, I'm sure, hearing more about it, um, but uh, that is, uh, will prove to be a very exciting venue um, for uh, this program, which is the first live um, uh, World Congress since um, uh, the uh, event that took place in Rome several years ago. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Ayanti uh, Wisher Widin, um, who is coming uh, to us this morning from Sydney, Australia. Um, she is a clinical endocrinologist at the Royal North Shore Hospital. She is currently undergoing additional studies in order to be awarded a PhD at the University of Sydney. Her research has taken uh, numerous directions, including the development of a predictive risk model for thyroid cancer, as well as a scoring system entitled IPET to analyze whole body um, iodine scans combined with FDG PET. Um, she has also explored the role of circulating DNA in advanced thyroid cancer, um, perhaps something we may get to um, e explore a little bit with her before the end of the hour. And in recognition of her contribution, she has received the Endocrine Society of Australia Higher Degree uh, Research um, Scholarship. So, Ayanthi, welcome. Um, uh, we are also joined this morning by Dr. Ali um, as with um, Azarani, uh, who is a consultant endocrinologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia. He is also a professor of medicine at Al Faisal um, University. Dr. Um, Azarani uh, is widely recognized for his expertise in thyroidology. He serves on a number of editorial boards um, in thyroid. Um, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, as well as the journal Endocrine. Uh, the primary focus of his research uh, relates to clinical and molecular aspects of thyroid cancer and endocrine genetics. And we are joined this morning by my colleague from Mount Sinai, Dr. Margaret Bramwine, um, who is uh, Chief of Head and Neck Pathology and Thyroid Pathology, um, who will help um, with, uh, uh, to round out the program after the presentations. Um, so everyone, as always, um, please send in your questions and, um, and comments. Uh, we will do our best to get to those before the end of the hour. Um, so uh, um, Ayanti, thank you. Um, Ali, thank you. And um, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kirkin. And thank you to the Thank Foundation for inviting us to present our recent publication called A Retrospective Cohort Study with Validation of Predictors of Differentiated Thyroid Cancer Outcomes, which was recently published in Thyroid. We have no financial disclosures to declare. As this audience well knows, radioactive iodine is commonly used following a total thyroidectomy. Radioactive iodine has three roles. One, to be used to treat, to ablate remnant thyroid tissue in low risk patients, Two, to be used as adjuvant therapy, targeting microscopic disease in intermediate risk patients. And three, to treat residual or metastatic disease in higher risk patients. Risk stratification is vital to decide between treatment goals to minimize both over and under treatment. The 2015 ATA modified initial risk stratification 
is a highly validated and universally utilized gold standard for risk stratification to guide differentiated thyroid cancer management. It consists of three classifications. Patients are classified as low risk if they have papillary thyroid cancer with no extracytal extension or venous invasion, if they have less than five pathological lymph nodes less than two millimeters in greatest diameter, or a follicular carcinoma with less than four foci of vascular invasion. High-risk patients are those with macroscopic extracytal extension with a pathological lymph node greater than three centimeters, distant metastases or a thyroglobulin suggestive of distant metastases or a follicular carcinoma with greater than four foci of vascular invasion. And in between are patients deemed intermediate risk. Limitations of these current guidelines is that in low ATA risk, it does not adequately identify patients who are very low risk that may potentially avoid radioactive iodine treatment. And furthermore, clinical and histopathological factors outside the guidelines have been associated with recurrence. So what are these variables associated with recurrence? Thyroglobulin is a tumor marker used to assess for recurrent disease. An undetectable thyroglobulin in low risk patients is associated with a very low risk of recurrence while a levothyroxine suppressed thyroglobulin levels of greater than 0.2 micrograms per litre suggest microscopic disease. A stimulated thyroglobulin greater than 30 raises the suspicions of metastatic disease. However, a low stimulated thyroglobulin in high risk patients does not reliably exclude recurrent disease. Postoperative thyroglobulin is recommended by the ATA guidelines but it is not incorporated into the initial risk stratification due to uncertainty around threshold values. Extracytal extension can predict recurrence and is present in 10 to 15% of patients with differentiated thyroid cancer. The ATA initial modified risk stratification classifies extracytal extension into three categories. No extracytal extension, microscopic or minimal extracytal extension, and macroscopic or gross extracytal extension. Gross extracytal extension is classified as high risk. It's an objective assessment determined at surgery. It's associated with poor prognosis and has a high risk of recurrence. Minimal extracytal extension is classified as intermediate risk and the influence on recurrence is less clear. The definition of minimal extracytal extension is subjective and histological definitions vary across institutions. The aim of our study was to determine the variables associated with synchronous metastases or recurrence and develop a predictive risk model in incorporating these factors into the ATA modified initial risk stratification. Our study is a retrospective analysis in which data was collected from a prospectively maintained thyroid cancer database. We included patients who are aged over 18 who were treated with radioactive iodine following a completion or total thyroidectomy for management for differentiated thyroid cancer at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, Australia. We had two cohorts of patients, a discovery cohort, which was patients treated between 2008 to 2016, and a validation cohort of patients treated between 2017 to 2021. A stimulated thyroglobulin was a thyroglobulin level measured when a TSH was greater than or equal to 30 milli international units per litre. The method of TSH stimulation was not recorded. However, since 2007, the Australian government has subsidised the cost of recombinant TSH in differentiated thyroid cancer patients, making it readily available. Stimulated thyroglobulin was measured using an emulite assay from 2008 to 2014, and a roche cobas assay from 2014 onwards. Thyroglobulin antibody was measured using an Abbott Architect assay. The assessment of extracytal extension was based on pathological assessment alone. We had a four-tiered classification in which category one was the tumour was completely confined to the thyroid parenchyma. Category two was the tumour underlies the junction of the thyroid abutting the adjacent soft tissue. Category three was that the tumor shows microscopic evidence of growth out of the thyroid into the adjacent parathyroidal fibroadipose tissue. And category four was that there was widespread extracytal spread into the soft tissue and or extension into the skeletal muscle 
including the strap muscles. Lymphovascular invasion was reported our in, at our institution after the entire capsule of the neoplasm was embedded for histological analysis. We had three classifications, small vessel invasion, which included lymphatic or capillary invasion, large vessel invasion, which usually involved veins or both. Now in practice, it can be quite difficult to separate invasions of lymphatics from the invasions of capillaries when only small vessel invasion is present. As all follicular carcinomas and the vast majority of oncocytic cell carcinomas spread via the bloodstream to distant sites, and most papillary carcinomas, carcinomas pre preferentially spread to the lymph nodes, for the purpose of this study to differentiate lymphatic from capillary invasion, we assumed that a papillary thyroid cancer and small vessel only invasion deemed lymphatic space invasion, while a follicular carcinoma oncocytic cell carcinoma and small vessel invasion was vascular invasion, and all patients with large vessel invasion was vascular invasion. The ATA modified initial risk categories were re retrospectively assigned for each patient. Survival data were obtained from medical records and publicly available death notices when was defined as the time from surgery until any cause of death. No local guidelines exist at our institution and follow-up was at the discretion of the treating clinician. We used synchronous metastases as defined as distance metastases, i.e. metastases outside of the neck present at the time of the diagnosis on structural imaging or noted on the initial post-treatment whole body iodine scan. Recurrence was defined as clinically significant progression that warranted either surgical intervention or administration of a second activity of radioactive iodine and not including synchronous metastases. Disease-free survival was the time to synchronous metastases or recurrence and was censored to death or the end of the study period. Our study had three parts. Firstly, we wanted to determine the factors associated with synchronous metastases and recurrence, and we did that using a multivariate analysis of the discovery cohort. Secondly, we wanted to develop a new predictive risk model by using these additional variables and incorporating them into the modified initial risk. And finally, we wanted to validate the predictive risk model by applying it back into the discovery cohort, as well as a second cohort defined as the validation cohort. 1,688 patients were treated with radioactive iodine between 2008 to 2021 for differentiated thyroid cancer. 391 patients were excluded due to no documented stimulated thyroglobulin or a TSH which was less than 30. In our two cohorts of our discovery cohort, there was 899 patients and in our validation cohort, there was 393 patients. Thyroglobulin antibody data was available for a subset of these patients with 497 patients available in the discovery cohort with thyroglobulin antibody data and 383 patients in the validation cohort. The baseline characteristics of both cohorts showed no significant difference in age, gender, or histology, but did differ in ATA risk, AJC stage four, and the activity received with higher activities administered in the discovery cohort compared to the validation cohort. On univariate and then multivariate analysis, looking at the variables of age, gender, stimulated thyroglobulin greater than 10, a 4T classification of exothyroid extension, central or lateral lymph node involvement, tumor size, lymphatic or vascular invasion, and histological subtype, we found on univariate analysis that a stimulated thyroglobulin greater than 10, category 4 extrathyroid extension, lateral lymph node involvement, tumor size, vascular invasion, and histological subtypes were associated with synchronous metastases. However, what remained on multivariate analysis to remain significant was a stimulated thyroglobulin greater than 10, category 4 extrathyroid extension, and histological subtype of multifocal PTC and follicular thyroid cancer. On a multivariate analysis of factors associated with recurrence in the discovery cohort, again using these same sub, uh, variables, we found on univariate analysis that a stimulated thyroglobulin greater than 10, both category 3 and category 4 extrathyroid extension, central and lateral lymph node involvement, lymphatic invasion, and histological subtypes were associated with recurrence. 
However, what remained on multivariate analysis was a stimulated thyroid globulin greater than 10, category four extravital extension, and central and lateral lymph node involvement remained significant on multivariate analysis to be associated with recurrence. In our discovery cohort, the median stimulated thyroid globulin was 0.9 micrograms per litre, and that was collected at a medium of 61 days post-operatively. A stimulated thyroid globulin of 8.5 on a receiver operator curve analysis afforded an optimal sensitivity and specificity with a J value of 0.36. A stimulated thyroid globulin of 10 micrograms per litre gave a J value of 0.35. For pragmatic reasons, we therefore incorporated a stimulated thyroid globulin of 10 micrograms per litre into our predictive risk model. And we found that patients with a stimulated thyroid globulin of greater than 10 were 9.5 times more likely to recur than patients with a stimulated thyroid globulin less than 10. We also found when we increased the threshold to greater than or equal to 30 in identifying patients with recurrence and synchronous metastases, a stimulated thyroid globulin greater than or equal to 30 had a specificity of 98%, a sensitivity of 21%, a negative predictive value of 78%, and a positive predictive value of 84%. Now, this graph shows the association between a stimulated thyroid globulin, ATA risk, and disease free survival. The ATA risk is represented by the blue, green, and red lines for low, intermediate, and high risk, respectively. Stimulated thyroid globulin less than 10 is marked as the dashed lines, and a stimulated thyroid globulin greater than 10 is marked as the solid lines. We found that a stimulated thyroid globulin greater than 10 was associated with recurrence independent of ATA risk. Patients with a low ATA risk and a stimulated thyroid globulin greater than 10, marked as the solid blue line, was associated with worse disease free survival than low risk patients with a stimulated thyroid globulin less than 10, marked as the dashed blue line and in fact had a similar risk to those with a high ATA risk and a stimulated thyroid globulin less than 10, marked as the red dashed lines. Now this graph looks at a subset of patients with thyroid globulin antibody data and a stimulated thyroid globulin less than 10 micrograms per litre. ATA risk is stratified by the varying dashed lines with low risk represented by the dotted lines to the high risk with the solid line. There was no difference in disease-free survival between those patients who are thyroid globulin antibody positive, marked as red lines, and patients who are thyroid globulin antibody negative, marked as a blue line in each of the ATA risk categories with a thyroid stimulated thyroid globulin of less than 10. When we looked at disease-free survival by pathological assessment of extrathyroidal extension, we found that like the others, the gross exothyroidal extension was associated with worse disease-free survival, which is marked as the blue line. We also showed that minimal exothyroidal extension or our category three, which is marked as the red line, is also associated with worse disease-free survival than patients classified as either category one or category two, which would be considered as tumor confined to the thyroid or no exothyroidal extension. So using these additional features, we extended the ATA modified initial risk to develop a new predictive risk model. Our model has four categories, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And what we wanted was to use a very low risk to be able to readily identify patients who may not require radioactive iodine therapy. We incorporated stimulated thyroglobulin and pathological assessment of extracidal extension into these three tiers. We found that there was a gradient of risk in our predictive risk model when applied to patients who had you know, the discovery cohort. Zero percent of patients were identified as having synchronous metastases or recurrence in our very low risk category. However, 23% of patients were identified as having recurrence or synchronous metastases in our high risk. And this was over a median follow-up of 84 months and a median time to recurrence of 13 months. As you can see by this table, our predictive risk model stratified more patients as high risk compared to the ATA guidelines in those with recurrence or synchronous metastases, with 23% of patients stratified as high risk in our model compared to 15% as high risk by the ATA guidelines. 
we were able to validate these results in our second cohort of patients who were followed up over a 34 month period with a median time to recurrence of 11 months. Again, in our very low risk group, no patients had a recurrence or synchronous metastases. However, in our high risk group, 18% of patients had recurrence or synchronous metastases. Our predictive risk model identified more patients with synchronous metastases or recurrence as high risk compared to the ATA modified initial risk in our discovery cohort. As you can see by this graph, 42% was uh, deemed as high risk by the predictive risk model compared to 12% by the um, ATA guidelines. And this was again replicated in our validation cohort, which identified 65% of patients as high risk compared to 35% of patients by deemed as high risk on the ATA modified initial risk. Using receiver operator curve analysis, we found that our predictive risk model had a greater diagnostic accuracy than the ATA risk categories in both the discovery and validation cohort with greater areas under the curve. So in summary, our data found that a stimulated thyroglobulin and pathological exothyroidal extension are important additions to calculating recurrence risk in differentiated thyroid cancer. Our new predictive risk model extends the ATA modified initial, initial risk stratification by including stimulated thyroglobulin and exothyroidal extension. Our model had a greater sensitivity than the ATA modified initial risk in identifying high risk patients with synchronous metastases and recurrence. Our data also supports a stimulated thyroglobulin of greater than or equal to 10 is associated with recurrence irrespective of ATA risk. We also found a stimulated thyroglobulin of greater than or equal to 30 identified patients as high risk with a specificity of 98%. And our data suggests that a thyroglobulin antibody in patients with a stimulated thyroglobulin of less than 10 did not alter initial recurrence risk. We found using a four teeth system to classify pathologically defined extrathyroidal extension, we found category three or minimal or microscopic extrathyroidal extension predicts recurrence. Now this did differ from what others have found before. So why is there a discrepancy? Well, most institutions group together extrathyroidal category one and extrathyroidal extension category two as confined to the thyroid. We assume that when category two extrathyroidal extension classification is removed, tumors are therefore either grouped into confined to the thyroid or microscopic extrathyroidal extension, leading to potential inter-observer discordance. Thereby good prognosis tumors may be misclassified as microscopic extrathyroidal extension. Our findings support the need for a clearly defined histological criteria for the different degrees of extrathyroidal extension that can be employed across different institutions. In our cohort, in 40 to 50% of distant metastases are present at diagnosis, i.e. they're synchronous. Identifying patients at risk of synchronous metastases is vital as pre-treatment whole body iodine scans are being less frequently utilized. In our data set, only 19% of patients with synchronous metastases were known prior to the initial radioactive iodine treatment. Our model, however, identified patients with synchronous metastases with greater confidence than the ATA guidelines. The strengths of our study is that it is a large single center trial. There was routine measurements of stimulated thyroglobulin at the time of the radioactive iodine treatment, and they're labeling a strong association between stimulated thyroglobulin and outcomes to be identified. We had a long-term follow-up of our discovery cohort of 84 months. There are, however, limitations. Firstly, it's a retrospective analysis. Our definition of recurrence potentially may have missed few patients who might have been treated in other institutions, as we defined recurrence as being a clinical significant recurrence that warrants further treatment with neither a dose of radioactive iodine or further surgery, and potentially some patients might have been treated at other centers. Furthermore, there was an absence of data for patients who did not receive radioactive iodine treatment. And finally, our model incorporates stimulated thyroglobulin, which can be difficult to guide radioactive iodine therapy, as the stimulated thyroglobulin at our institution is measured only 24 hours prior to the radioactive iodine being administered. 
In conclusion, stimulated thyroid globulin and histological exothyroid extension are independent predictors of recurrence and synchronous metastases in differentiated thyroid cancer. Our predictive risk model identified patients with a high or very low risk of synchronous metastases and recurrence with a greater accuracy than the ATA guidelines. Our predictive risk model serves as a platform for future studies to guide radioactive iodine treatment decisions in the management of differentiated thyroid cancer. I'd like to acknowledge all the authors that were involved in these studies, in particular, endocrinologist Professor Clifton By and anatomical pathologist Professor Anthony Gill. Again, I have no financial disclosures and thank you. And I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Ali Al-Zahani. Thank you. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to comment on this uh, excellent paper and the excellent presentation. I would like to thank, uh, thank Foundation for inviting me to do this. I have nothing to disclose and I'm going to talk uh, uh, a little bit about uh, historical background of the ATA uh, risk stratification and give an update on it and then comment on the current study. So the first attempt to uh, come up with uh, uh, guidelines uh, is, was published actually in 1996. Uh, and this is basically more of a narrative review rather than guidelines. There are no specific recommendation. Those experts reviewed the current status of science at that time and um, uh, made uh, some recommendations in the form of basically um, uh, review article, I would say. The first real attempt is, is in 2006, uh, where the first uh, uh, version of the ATA guidelines came into thyroid. And in that version, actually, the only risk stratification system that was mentioned is the TNM uh, uh, classification, which we all know that it is a classification that is used to predict mortality. And this was the sixth uh, edition of that uh, version. However, the revised uh, version in 2009 uh, made uh, the first uh, uh, basically draft of the current ATA guidelines for st uh, risk stratification. So as you can see here in this text, uh, it says basically the AJCC IUCC staging was developed to predict risk of death, not recurrence, which is exactly the case. And we know that death uh, risk is very low in thyroid cancer, while recurrence is quite common. And for the assessment of risk of recurrence, uh, they uh, came up with three level uh, stratification system, the low risk, the intermediate risk, and the high risk. And I think we are all aware of the, the criteria for making those um, uh, risk stratifications. So essentially low risk is an is a intrathyroidal tumor that has no invasion and no lymph node metastasis, no distant metastasis, and it is completely removed. The high risk is basically patients who have macroscopic tumor invasion or incomplete tumor resection, distant metastasis or uh, high serum thyroglobulin out of proportion to uh, what is seen on both therapy scan. An intermediate risk is something in between, uh, and that include basically microscopic invasion of the tumor in the very thyroid and soft tissue, or cervical lymph node metastasis on core iodine scan that's showing uptake outside the thyroid bed and finally, aggressive histology or vascular invasion. So this was the initial draft of this, and it was based at that time mostly on expert opinion. There were no strong data to base this, but it, it turns out to be well thought of and, uh, and very valid. Uh, in 2009, also they made the comment that the, the AJCC stage of the patient does not change over time. However, depending on the clinical course of the disease and response to the therapy, the risk of recurrence and the risk of death may change over time. This is basically talking about dynamic risk stratification, which was not uh, still uh, very familiar to people at that time. I remember Dr. Tetel was uh, lecturing about it, but uh, nobody really uh, perceived it well until uh, sometime later. Now, as I mentioned, 2009 revised the ATA guidelines, and this proposal was mostly based on expert opinion rather than solid evidence. However, several uh, uh, groups started to validate this, and uh, you can see uh, this table here. Uh, 
that was published actually in the uh, next guidelines uh, validated the 2009 ATA risk stratification. So if we look at this, we have the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And if you look at the percentage of people who do not have evidence of disease, net is no evidence of disease, it is highest in the low risk group, and then around 50 to 60% in the intermediate and very low in the high risk group. So obviously this system works very well and predict actually the risk of disease versus no disease. If we look on the right side here for structurally incomplete disease, you can see in the low risk group, it's very rare. In the high risk group, it's quite common. So the high risk uh, patients around 60 to 70% of them will continue to have evidence of structurally incomplete disease. And in the intermediate risk group, you have something in between. For this reason, because of this validation in, the, in those study and many other studies, the 2015 American Thyroid Association guidelines embraced and ad adopted actually the 2009 ATA initial risk stratification, as you can see here in this recommendation. The 2009 ATA initial risk stratification system is recommended for DTC patients treated with thyroidectomy based on its utility in predicting risk of disease recurrence and or persistence. So this was a strong recommendation with moderate level uh, uh, evidence. They made also some uh, additional statements uh, um, in, in here saying that additional prognostic variables uh, that are not included in the 2009 ATA uh, risk stratification might actually be used to further refine risk stratification for DTC as described uh, in their text. And uh, however, the incremental benefit of adding this specific prognostic variable to 2009 initial risk stratification system has not been established. And then they made also a comment on the molecular testing and mutational information uh, basically more or less uh, neutral statement saying while not routinely recommended for initial post-operative risk stratification, the mutational status of BRAF and TERT might actually uh, refine the risk estimates. So the major thing here is that they have adopted the 2009 ATA risk stratification and modified it a little bit. We are all familiar with this uh, uh, graph or, or this chart from the American Thyroid Association 2015 uh, guidelines. They maintained actually the three uh, level of risk, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Everything here in, in, uh, in uh, white is the original 2009. And the suggested modifications are in, in blue here. So for example, in the high risk, uh, any lymph node more than three centimeter will put the patient in a high risk. Uh, for the intermediate risk, previously, any patient with lymph node metastasis will be in the intermediate risk, but they divided it to more than five involved lymph nodes between 0 0.2 to three centimeter and less than five lymph node uh, micrometastases less than 0.2 centimeter, which will fall in the low risk group. They emphasized, however, that uh, the risk is a continuum. And uh, as we go from below here upwards, uh, the, the risk increases even within, within each of these uh, categories. In fact, I know that they were debating whether those categories should be kept or, uh, or, or deleted and we just use uh, the, the, the continuous risk uh, model. However, they feel that it's important to keep them so we can communicate with each other uh, in a more clear way and also for epidemiological studies. I had the pleasure and honor of uh, writing a review article for JCEM with Dr. Tatil, who is a pioneer in the area of risk stratification. I was in New York for two months in 2018 and um, had the chance to, uh, to learn from him first and then to write this review article with him. So as you know, uh, the risk stratification is a continuous process. It, it is not limited to only a uh, post-operative period. In fact, it starts from the beginning here when, we, when the patient presents to us. But for thyroid cancer, uh, most of them will go for thyroid surgery. And we see them usually six to eight weeks later. Here is where uh, the ATA risk stratification or the TNM, AJCC, eighth edition stratification, takes place and predict the future. 
So for AJCC uh, 8 edition, we uh, know that we uh, divide patients in stage one, two, three, or four, and this predicts the risk of death. For the ATA, we have low, intermediate, or high risk, and this predicts recurrent persistent disease. During the follow-up, the value of these systems become less important, and now we depend more and more on the response to therapy or what is called dynamic risk stratification, which stratify patients into excellent, biochemically incomplete, structurally incomplete, and indeterminate response. And I know uh, people are aware of all of this. Let me now review some uh, data following the 2015 ATA guidelines. So in support of its uh, validity and, and, and powerful uh, uh, utilization. So this is data from our hospital, actually. We uh, were interested to look at the natural course of uh, the American Thyroid Association response to therapy status, the dynamic risk stratification. We wanted to see if the dynamic risk stratification continue to be useful throughout the, 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 the follow-up. And um, however, we also assessed uh, the ATA risk group, the TNM risk group, and the response to therapy. So we studied around 500 patients who underwent total thyroidectomy and received radioactive iodine, ablation, or therapy. And as you can see here on the left side, the ATA risk groups uh, or the ATA system works very well. So those with low uh, stage did very well. The, the disease-free probability or recurrence was very low. Most of them continue to enjoy uh, disease-free survival. Uh, the intermediate risk also did well, although some of them start to have recurrence later on after around um, um, seven, eight years. The group that we are all aware of it, its risk is the high risk group, and you can see clearly that the high risk group did not do as well as those groups. And this is obviously uh, the case basically with any study, but you can see that the ATA risk uh, stratification separated the groups very well. In contrast, for example, to TNM8, which uh, is a designed to predict mortality, but here we are assessing the recurrence and you can see the overlap here. The response to therapy uh, system also works very well. So patients in excellent response did well. Those in indeterminate response also for the most part did well. Biochemically incomplete, not as well. And the worst uh, 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 group is those with structurally incomplete response. We also studied the course and predictive factors of incomplete response. And incomplete response here is incomplete biochemically or structurally in two groups, low and intermediate risk thyroid cancer. And you can see again, the ATA uh, uh, risk stratification system works very well in, in, in here. This is the low risk. This is the intermediate risk. This is around 506 patients. We, did, we excluded here high risk. And you can see the system works beautifully and separate those two groups very nicely. And their overall uh, prognosis is excellent. This is the recurrence rate here. We looked at different factors that may predict outcome or incomplete response. So uh, two of them remained strongly uh, associated with incomplete biochemical or structural response. One of them is age, which is not included in the ATA uh, system. And the other one is lymph node metastasis, which is included, but uh, we have also some ana analysis on this. So when we looked at, uh, at, a, at lymph node, uh, we found that the central lymph node metastasis did not predict incomplete response, but lateral uh, lymph node metastasis were very highly associated with the risk of incomplete response. And also, if you have lateral plus central lymph node, again, there was a strong uh, association with incomplete response. When we looked at the age, it was interesting for us that age here uh, performs as a, as a continuous variable. If you look at the age group here on the left side, 25 years, 8, 28, 29, and so on, and uh, here incomplete response below the age or above the age limit, and you can see actually that no significant difference before age 32, but as we reach 33, we start to see a difference between those above this age and below this age. 
And this significant level increases uh, uh, in a very nice way as the age increases. So we concluded here that age is a continuous risk factor for incomplete response and that age more than 33 years is significantly associated with incomplete response. This is not only uh, our data, also data from New York, from Dr. Bokai and Dr. Shah uh, for high risk patients. Remember here we studied low and intermediate risk. Uh, in this study from Memorial uh, Hospital, uh, they studied actually um, the high risk patients. And again, you can see nicely that patients less than 55 years of age did better although they have high risk, but they did better than those more than 55 years of age. So the excellent response was 40% compared to only 27% in the older patients. And the structurally incomplete response was more common and at a higher rate in those more than 55 years of age. This is a prospective study that evaluated um, uh, the American Thyroid Association uh, risk stratification from Italy, so around 2,071 patients from 40 Italian uh, centers prospectively followed. Um, around 60% of them uh, underwent total thyroidectomy and remanent ablation, uh, around 40% only total thyroidectomy, and, and around 3.5 uh, just lobectomy. And the outcome at one year is to look for structural disease at one year. This is the low risk group, intermediate and high risk group. And you can see those who continue to have structural persistence was very low in the low risk group, more in the intermediate risk group, and much more in the high risk group. So it's clear that the ATA staging system works beautifully in those patients. This is the most recent one. I've just seen this today, actually. This is a, an article that is published in Thyroid uh, in December this, this year or, or just last year, around a month ago. This is a prospective implementation of 2015 ATA guidelines and modified ATA uh, recurrence uh, risk stratification. So this group from, uh, uh, from uh, Alberta basically decided in 2017 to follow exactly the American Thyroid Association guidelines 2015 in the management and also risk stratification. So as you can see here in this uh, chart, they had uh, a total of uh, uh, 612 DTC patients and uh, they excluded patients who are not yet two years after their management, they exclude patients who did not have uh, data. They ended up with 479 patients with two year follow-up after managing them according to the 2015 ATA guidelines. And you can see here that um, uh, the risk stratification, uh, 53 of them, 53% of them were in the low risk, 27 in the intermediate risk and 20 in the high risk group. And the management was also uh, uh, between total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine or total thyroidectomy alone or lobectomy alone, again, according to the guidelines. So how did that uh, work? Uh, you can see here that the likelihood of structurally incomplete disease versus excellent response was actually uh, very nicely predicted by the ATA guidelines. So intermediate uh, group had around three times higher uh, risk than the low risk group, and the high group had around uh, five times higher risk uh, than um, the intermediate group. And you can see the, the uh, odds ratio here is quite very high for the high risk group. And there is significant difference between the high risk and the intermediate risk and the low risk patients. So uh, the bottom line from all of this is, is that uh, the American Thyroid Association guidelines work very well in, in, in this prospective study that followed the American, the American Thyroid Association 2015 guidelines. This is their, uh, again, uh, uh, summary of the outcome. You can see here that this is for all patients. This is for papillary thyroid cancer alone. And this is the low risk patients. Most of them, they achieved excellent response. Some of them had biochemically incomplete or indeterminate response. And the structural disease was only in 2%. When you go to the intermediate risk, the structural disease 
And then we have intermediate rest, uh, indeterminate response of 6%, biochemically incomplete 23%, and excellent response 64%. And the high risk group does not do well. As you can see here, uh, uh, excellent response is only in less than 40%. 33% uh, had structural disease and then indeterminate response in 10%, and biochemically incomplete in around 20%. The PTC is similar uh, picture, more or less. So I think we can conclude from all of this that the American Thyroid Association risk stratification works well for prediction of recurrence. However, some other important predicted factors are not included or need further exploration, including age, as I show uh, serum thyroid globulin, as, uh, uh, as mentioned in the study, the extra thyroid extension, although it is uh, included, but it may need further exploration. And I think the mutational uh, status is, is also very important and probably will come in the next guidelines. And finally, there are attempts to integrate both the AJCC TNM system and the ATA uh, uh, system in one, in one system. I know that, that Dr. Tatil published on this uh, a couple of papers and many other people are trying this. So uh, since uh, our article today include uh, serum thyroglobulin as a strong predictor of recurrence, I just uh, want to review this uh, meta-analysis and systematic review that was published only uh, two, three months ago in thyroid. From the group that are working today on, um, on the new ATA guidelines, and you can see uh, here uh, in 15 studies that assess the accuracy of post-operative thyroglobulin measurement before administration of radioactive iodine. Uh, basically, those studies assist the accuracy of post-operative thyroglobulin measurement to predict metastatic or persistent disease. And in 10 studies, uh, the same thing was used for lymph node metastases or distant metastases. The proportion of patients with lymph node metastasis in these studies ranged between 0.8% to 66%. So you can see very heterogeneous group. And the proportion of patients with distant metastasis ranged between 1.7% to around 23%. Again, very heterogeneous group. The sensitivity of serum thyroglobulin for any metastatic disease were ranged between 40% to 100%, again, showing you the very heterogeneous uh, uh, type of studies. And the threshold was, um, was variable. Detectable, for example, had a sensitivity of around 80%. 0.9 had a sensitivity of 100%, but specificity of only 0.42%. Oh, and if you increase the thyroglobulin uh, threshold to around 12, the sensitivity is around 90% and the specificity is around 80%. So you would think that this is perfect, but actually the quality of those studies is well, just fair to poor. You can see that all of them were, had very low uh, quality. Extra thyroid extension was also analyzed in this systematic review and meta-analysis. And you can see that this is, this is a better study and better um, uh, information and data. You can see that minimal extra thyroid extension was a strong predictor of recurrence, but it was not strong predictor of mortality. So let's just uh, one more time look at this. The current study, I think maybe for the sake of time, I will not uh, go over the details. I think you have heard it, but I just want to emphasize the, the definitions that were used here. Uh, the definition of recurrence was uh, a clinically significant progression requiring either surgical intervention or administration of a second activity of radioactive iodine. And then synchronous metastases are those distant metastases outside the neck that were present at the time of diagnosis on a structural imaging or initial post-operative treatment. I'll just skip this because it was already covered by Dr. Wardeen, but I want to uh, emphasize the strengths and weaknesses of this study one more time for the sake of discussion. So I think the strength is, is a large number of patients treated at one academic center. Uh, as mentioned, there's a discovery and validation cohort just to make sure that uh, the data is consistent. And there's a, a, an excellent comprehensive analysis and excellent writing and presentation. 
But the weaknesses in my uh, view is, uh, again, this is a retrospective study. Probably this is not a major weakness since most of the studies in thyroid cancer are retrospective. But I think the definitions, I have problem with them. Again, recurrence was a disease that has progressed or needed and needed surgery or another dose of radioactive iodine. And I don't think the group who have stable structural or biochemical disease is small. In fact, I think the majority of patients have stable uh, structural or biochemical disease. So I think uh, they may have missed significant number of patients with the disease. Synchronous metastasis, uh, distant metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Uh, this is part of the initial presentation in my view, and the American Thyroid Association was designed not to look for synchronous metastasis. It was designed to predict future recurrence, and therefore uh, the, the comparison with the current model may not have been quite fair to the American Thyroid Association uh, stratification system. As I mentioned earlier, the ATA is a continuum, continuum of risk, but here we compare the risk uh, categories, and therefore it's again another point that should be taken in consideration. I understand that uh, 497 patients had, it seemed to me after the, the review by Dr. Wardeen is that uh, only 497 patients had TG antibody, so significant number of patients did not have TG antibody, and I think that makes also the utilization of TG uh, of some uh, question, because we know that in thyroid cancer, anywhere between 25 to 30% of patients will have TG antibody positive. And finally, there are uh, some um, uh, uh, comments from the editorial that came with this paper on the definition of uh, extrathyroid extension and vascular invasion. So I conclude by saying that the 2015 uh, American Thyroid Association stratification system is an excellent system for prediction of uh, uh, DTC recurrence. However, I admit that additional predictive factors not included in the current uh, system may fine tune the system further, and that include, uh, but not limited to age, uh, extrathyroid extension, post-operative uh, thyroglobulin, and I think the mutational status is also very important. And hopefully we'll see all of these factors coming in the new ATA guidelines that are, that, uh, are ongoing. And with that, I'll stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to um, Ayanti and to Ali. Um, Ayanti, maybe if uh, we can start with maybe with your response uh, to the comments, um, and then we'll open this up in the uh, limited time available to some further questions here. Thanks, Dr. Egan. Thank you, Dr. Alzarani. That was an excellent discussion, and I completely um, except that the ATA guidelines is highly validated and agree that it is an excellent risk stratification model. And that is why we used it as the basis of our model. And we didn't actually change the model at all, by, except adding on these additional features, because we did accept that we did not want to remove any of the factors that were already highly validated through multiple studies, as you have shown. Um, in terms of the synchronous metastases, I think it is important that we do incorporate it into any future modeling. The reason being is that because such a significant number of patients are actually missed of having synchronous metastases until after they've already had their initial treatment. And I think it is incredibly important to be able to identify these patients early so that they can be treated with the appropriate dose that they require so that additional therapies are not required, and which causes obviously undue stress for patients. Um, so that is the reason why we incorporate it. Completely agree that, that the ATA modified initial risk did not deem that in, but I think that in future deliberations, it's something that we need to think about in stratifying those high risk patients is that we actually group and identify synchronous metastases as well. Great. I agree with that. Yeah. So, so there is a question um, that uh, from Dr. Coben regarding patients in your um, uh, study um, who had positive antibodies, but a thyroglobulin less than 10, um, whether you were, um, you tried to verify the accuracy of the thyroglobulin uh, by further analysis. No, unfortunately, as this was a retrospective study, we weren't able to have access to doing that. Um, so they were only analyzed by the immunoassay, but I do take their point that that could have potentially been for further study, that would be an important way of analyzing. Great. 
Dr. Bramwein, would you like to comment a little bit on um, the breakdown of this uh, four-tiered system of extrathyroidal? Yes. Sure, thank you very much, Mark. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate um, the authors on the, on the size and the magnitude of this retrospective study. So um, on multivariate analysis, your, one of your conclusions regarding um, uh, ETE are, are um, you know, confirm what we already know, which is gross ETE um, is really significant in terms of uh, predicting recurrence. But the, the issue of microscopic ETE does not go away on a day-to-day -day basis as we do our risk assessment, our ATA risk assessment. So what I want to comment is the difference between um, what's written in the manuscript in terms of adipose uh, invasion, clear adipose invasion, and fiber adipose invasion, the difference between those two terms is actually a world of difference. And of course, one of the limitations that any pathologist can tell you is when um, PTC invades outside of the thyroid, it also um, uh, produces a desmoplastic stroma in most cases. So the majority of PTCs which demonstrate microscopic ETE don't actually show an actual um, juxtaposition of cancer with fat. It's more an issue of um, approximating in a reasonable manner where the end of the where the thyroid ends and the microscopic and sorry and the the extrathyroid extrathyroidal soft tissue begins and so I wanted to ask you about that um, if you can comment on that further that's one question second question is uh, or a comment would be since this is a, 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 a you know an important point um, it should have been illustrated uh, microscopically in this in this um, excellent uh, uh, publication of yours. Thank you for that question. So we, we use this four tier classification system and I do appreciate what you're saying in terms of the fibro adipose tissue to the adipose tissue, um, but that was the classification that was already used in our institution. So that was why we went through that four tiered analysis and we found that yes, it did allow for a spectrum of risk to be identified and we did were able to you know, stratify that minimal extravital extension had had worse disease-free survival than the other two, category one and category two. Um, and I think it would have been, you know, what you said, we, we put a, um, a graphical image, which we thought would be more um, uh, for the thyroid cancer readership might be more understandable. So I did a schematic, but I can appreciate what you're saying that a, a pathological imaging would have also added to the sure. paper and maybe understand particularly to a pathologist yeah. perspective, a bit more clarity in what we were deeming by our four clarification classifications. Sure. So, you know, um, I suspect that in the future, uh, microscopic ETE may go away from being a being a feature that will uh, bump a tumor from low risk to intermediate to the to the bottom rung of intermediate risk. Um, I think that's the way the trend is going. And so, um, you know, along the way, we should have some. It, if it goes away altogether, then it becomes a uh, you know, not really an important question, but until it goes away, um, I, I think uh, more clarity for that. Another comment I want to make is when you look at the um, uh, the CAP synoptic, the distinction. Uh, so microscopic strap muscle is has been recently introduced into the CAP synoptic in the absence of um, the surgeon's uh, uh, determination of gross ETE. And as you know, the determination of gross ETE is also not entirely objective. It can be sometimes mm -hmm. subjective. Um, and I, so I wonder if you could comment on that. So in, in our study, we did not have any correlation. We, we assumed that the gross extrathyroidal extension that we were visualizing on the pathological assessment was seen from the surgeon um, interoperatively, but we unfortunately weren't able to confirm that. So we assumed that the gross extravital extension was, but we did not. So we weren't able to clarify whether that class of, um, category four was in fact gross at the time of surgery as well. Right. So, uh, so again, I want to highlight that as sort of a, a fuzzy point that um, uh, we that is a leading edge to work on. So um, there are times that my surgeons will say that there was definitely gross extrathyroid spread. And what I can document histologically is more a reaction. 
either to uh, assist rupture or FNA or something. There's actually no tumor, but there's a lot of desmoplasia there. So, um, and then there are times that I see- It's my not ours. There we go. Uh, okay, thank you very much. If I could just um, finish up here, we're right up against the nine o'clock hour. In, in 30 seconds or less um, for Ali and Ayanti, can you just speculate of what you think risk um, the risk models will look like in five years and 10 years from now. Where do you think we will be? Ali, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I, I think the, the uh, ATA guidelines will continue to be extremely uh, useful. I think in the next ATA guidelines, they will incorporate the age. This is just my assumption, the age, uh, maybe even serum thyroglobulin, but I think more likely the mutational status. I think the molecular data is becoming stronger. And I think in the future, uh, we may come up with one model uh, that uh, predicts uh, uh, survival and recurrence. Ayanti? Yeah, I truly think we're going towards more and more personalized medicine. And I believe that having that continuum of risk as well as personalized approach and with, as you said, mutational markers and all of these additional features, I think will be what we'll be seeing in the next five to 10 years. So do you the both, guidelines. Thank you. Do you both project that we will be looking more at a spectrum and get rid of a tiered system here? Hard to say. <laughs> okay. Very we'll probably good. agree with more of a spectrum, but we'll see. Great. Listen, thank you very much, Ayanti. Um, it's one o'clock in the morning. I can't thank you enough um, for your um, uh, for, for agreeing and uh, for your efforts. And Ali, thank you. Dr. Bramwine, thank you very much. Everybody stay safe and look forward to seeing you again next week here. Have a great day. <laughs>